Good afternoon and welcome to the second Capsulas de Traducción, the online open access conversations between the specialists, such as the two women uh, we have today, from various fields of translation and interpreting, and the faculty of the Department of Translation of the Universidad de Vic, Universidad Central de Catalunya. We are delighted today to have uh, Maria Sanchez here, senior analyst at Unbabel, a company specializing in combining neural machine translation with machine learning, AI, and crowdsourcing to offer advanced translation services internationally. And of course, Vanessa Enriquez, professor at the University of Vic, and also specialized in the integration of technologies in translation and efficiency in the search for information in digital environments. Today's talk is called Among Algorithm translation in the area of artificial intelligence. Before anything else, I would like to thank uh, once again all the people who make uh, this event possible. And I would like um, to mention the organizations that have promoted this activity, such as IDISC, Feds Forward, Pen Catalan, Eumo Editorial, Instituto Ramón Llui, ATRAE, la Asociación de Traducción y Adaptación Audiovisual de España, AICE, la Asociación de Intérpretes de Conferencia de España, APTIC, la Asociación Profesional de Traductores e Intérpretes de Cataluña, and APAC, la Asociación de Profesorado de Inglés de Cataluña. And of course, to all of you who are connected right now with us today. If you want to follow us on Twitter or other, any other social network, uh, remember that our hashtag is Conversatrat. You have also the chat to share uh, any thoughts and questions here. After the conversation, we will pass them on to the speakers. And you can also apply for a badge certifying your attendance at the um, event today. Thank you very much. And Vanessa, the floor is yours. Thank you, Paula. And uh, welcome, everyone, to this much anticipated Capsulas de Traducción here at the University of Vic. Today's session holds a very special place in my heart um, as we're joined by not only an esteemed expert in translation, but also a dear friend and longtime colleague, Dr. Marina Sanchez Toro. Now, Marina and I go way back in our days as undergrad students in translation and interpreting, a path we both began in 1995. And since then, I have witnessed Marina uh, evolve from a passionate student and become a leader in, in the field of translation and translation technologies. I also had the distinct honor of supervising together with um, Philip Cohen from Johns Hopkins University, her avant-garde doctoral thesis, which was groundbreaking work in post-editing and interactive translation prediction with neural machine translation. And we're talking about 2015 here, that is the year before Google officially announced its neural machine translation system. So it is perhaps no wonder that her doctoral research was described as nothing short of revolutionary. Her unique blend of academic rigor and integrity and practical industry experience allows her to make impactful contributions to the field, above all in the form of real world applications in translation, and more recently in linguistic AI. Marina, it's such a joy to have you here with us today. And thanks for joining me. Where are you based mm -hmm. right now? Uh, uh, thank you. Well, I'm a bit overwhelmed by that introduction, but um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm based in Lisbon. I've been here for the past four years. Um, mm -hmm. Since 2019, uh, when I started working from Babel. So yeah. Yeah, yeah, good. So, so to think to kick things off a little bit, could you share with us uh, a bit more about your path from our university days to to your current role and Babel and how you landed this role? Um, yeah. So, um, I love languages, as every translation graduate I think does, and um, I also love data and I love the machine translation side of it, but I started loving it, let's say, when machine translation was made in a much more um, artisanal way than, than it is now. Uh, mm -hmm. So after graduating from translation and interpreting, I did an MSc in machine translation and then um, the PhD in translation studies with Vanessa. In between, I worked as a, I had 
different jobs all had to do in some measure with language. Uh, I worked on and off as a translator, data analyst as well. I did some marketing as well. Um, and yeah, but uh, since 2019, I'm here um, in Lisbon, in Ambabel. I Once I was scrolling through Twitter and I saw a job offer, I applied to it and then, yeah. <laughs> And, and that was yeah, yeah. Twitter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Very good. Now, give us a bit of an overview of um, Bubble. Like, um, what type of clients does the company serve, and uh, what kind of key services it offers, and what its technology looks like, basically. Um, so, um, Bubble is pretty uh, recent. It was founded in 2013, and the initial focus was uh, machine translation and post editing services in the field of customer service. So for example, when you send an email to Amazon because something didn't arrive or something like that, so we would uh, you know, translate those interactions. Mm -hmm. uh, more recently, Ambabel acquired two um, LSPs, two language service providers, Lingo24 and EBS. And uh, they also bought a provider of website localization technology, Bablic. Uh, mm -hmm. so it was an expansion from customer service content to more of a traditional uh, type of uh, content, more publishable, like press releases, legal, marketing, financial content. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I'm I'm part of the community team at Unbabel, mm -hmm. and we, you know, we are uh, responsible for everything that has to do with humans. That means every translation workflow that ends in a human. And uh, there are uh, several uh, types of translation we offer. Not all of them involve human intervention. Um, and what we do, essentially, we try to ensure that our freelance linguists um, have what they need to deliver uh, the translations in the way we want them to deliver, like uh, expected quality, expected turnaround time. So yeah. That's, that's more or less the summary of, mm -hmm. of it. Okay, so, so basically your current role is as a community team leader, basically. So you manage community translators uh, um, slash I, editors or... I, I'm a bit of, um, I mean, I'm, I get to apply my linguistic knowledge, also my data analysis uh, skills, I would say. I am. So we are a large team. There's a lot of translators, uh, freelance translators who work for us. Um, I, I, I think I'm. I would have a hard time describing in a few words what I do, but more or less is, um, you know, I spend a lot of time looking at data, language data, quality data, uh, productivity data, um, with, you know, the goal essentially is how to make our translations better and more efficient. Uh, there's also a component of um, coming up with um, creative solutions to some problems. Um, you know, there's uh, many aspects that in affect uh, quality of a translation, not just how good the machine translation is or how experienced the translator is. There are issues around interface design, uh, what features, what workflow elements, uh, what uh, documentation, what instructions we have. So I try to, um, you know, ensure that I do my bit to to help the team make sure that everything kind of falls into place, you know. Very good. So, so since you mentioned quality in, basically that's what you look after um, in your role. Uh, how important is quality to to Unbubble's uh, client base. I mean, especially from the perspective of machine translation and 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 the wide assumption that translation is a solved problem <laughs> from the point of view of technology, right? So, um, how important is it, and uh, yeah. what quality measures do you implement mm. in the workflows? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't think translation is a solved problem. But, um, from the point of view of technology, I think it's uh, you know there's this kind of uh, Assumption. I don't know. Let's say it's solved in certain cases up to a certain percentage. Imagine ninety-five percent, but the top five percent is definitely not solved. So, um, with regards to quality, it depends on many factors. For example, 
and, and what the client wants. Imagine there's some client who only wants to translate live chat. They are, you know, they're able to say, okay, uh, it makes sense for them to just go from a synchronization only, even if there are some issues, because the communication has to be in real time. And that's the main um, solution, the, the main problem to solve, let's say. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, some other clients or the same client may want a translation of the emails, for example, that the customer agents receive. There's some time to provide that translation. There's a need uh, to make sure that the message is clear. So we can put a human step there. Um, in between that human step, in between the machine translation and the human step, there also may be what, what's called quality estimation step. Uh, quality estimation um, algorithm, what it does is it looks at the source text, it looks at the machine translation, and it says, okay, um, this machine translation uh, is good. You can send it directly to the client, or this machine translation is bad, it's better to route it to, towards a human. Um, so in, in many cases, there's a, there needs to be a balance between speed and quality, and there's a trade-off between yeah. the different um, mm -hmm. use cases, yeah. Yeah, yeah obviously, it is not a, a solved problem, but sometimes I have the feeling that that's the general assumption in amongst non-experts in the fields, and I wonder how much emphasis clients these days uh, put on quality translations. Um, but since you mentioned that uh, you've implemented or you implement different workflows of, according to different levels of quality that aligns with, with what's going on in the top segment of the industry, really, the top 100 LSPs, uh, so to speak. Um, I wonder if you could just let us know a little bit about the challenges and benefits that, that you encounter when managing community translation projects with these workflows, that is machine mm -hmm. translation plus post editing or machine translation plus quality estimation and then post editing. Mm -hmm. um, so Ambabel operates on a first come first serve basis. Mm -hmm. um, translations are made available to our wide group of translators, um, they have to meet certain conditions. Uh, mm -hmm. So they have to have a specific quality rating. They have to have a subject matter expertise assigned to them. <clears throat> For example, when we receive a business communication to be translated, only translators specialized in uh, translating business documentation will be able to see the task. Mm -hmm. So. Um, one challenge of this model, a uh, big one, is you have to ensure that you have enough translators. So there's always someone to pick the job on time. But you also don't want to have a too big of a community, which means that a large part of the people don't have work. Mm -hmm. And they're just kind of waiting for, you know, uh, receiving a notification. Mm -hmm. um, some languages, some language combinations are also harder to sort. So um, imagine uh, it's more or less easy to find expert medical translators in English to German, but the moment you take English out of the equation, things get harder. For example, uh, Bulgarian into uh, German, for example. Um, mm. So some languages are harder than others. And there's also a lot of language pairs. We have more than 80 now. Um, in general, it's a challenge to ensure you have enough people for um, for those languages, you know. And the biggest challenge of all, from my point of view, and I'm biased because that's what I do, is, uh, you know, ensure we have a comprehensive picture of the quality of our pool. You know, um, more or less, we send out for translation, and I'm not counting machine translation only here. I'm counting all the content that goes to humans. We send out maybe 20 million words per month. And we have um, thousands of translators that are active in a given month. Now, that's a lot of people that you have to um, keep track of. Um, in general, we, we implement several quality checks, let's say. 
when you want to join as a translator, you have to pass certain tests. Um, you are also evaluated periodically. Um, some of the work that you do is also sent for a deeper evaluation, let's say for a uh, thorough annotation based on MQM. And we do a lot of monitoring of uh, data points. Some, some things you can use as sort of, uh, not proxy for quality, but maybe a signal that there may be something that is out of the ordinary. So outliers, values that are too low or too high in certain metrics. For example, if there's uh, one translator who's uh, very, very slow, it takes forever to work on a task, you know, you want to investigate in the same way that you want to investigate if there's someone who's super fast at delivering stuff. Um, something so, wrong. <laughs> yeah, sometimes it's not it's not always the case because you know sometimes um, the machine translation is so good that yeah they didn't have to change anything but yeah there are some problems sometimes that you spot with this monitoring of metrics yeah mm -hmm. so so looking at outliers and then um, starting yeah, or starting... analyzing behavioral yeah. patterns basically mm -hmm. very good yeah. you mentioned before MQM. Uh, for those in the audience who are not familiar with this uh, quality assessment uh, model, can you can you elaborate what MQM stands for and how it works very quickly? Yeah, so it um, stands for multidimensional quality metrics, and it's um, an, an attempt, let's say, of uh, standardizing quality evaluation across different language service providers. So quality is notoriously hard to measure. It's not like time or, you know, um, uh, what sounds good to me may not sound good to someone who's 20 years younger than me or 20 years older. So um, this um, MQM, what it has is it has a set of issues that you can kind of choose, configure. So the typical dimensions of accuracy, fluency style. It has a set of severities. Um, mm -hmm. There may be some issues that are minor, some are major, some are so bad that are critical and that make the translation unusable. And then you also have a mechanism to, uh, you know, based on this, uh, the number of issues and their severity to assign a quality score to a translation. Right. It's not, yeah, it's never objective, um, but it's the closest thing we have to, to something right. objective. So, so basically, in addition to post editing, that quality estimation, that quality uh, annotation, really, it's used to then, I suppose, train your machine translation engines, right? And um, is that MQM system also used in in error in translation error annotation, or could you maybe show mm -hmm. us a little bit? I know that you've got a screenshot somewhere <laughs> about of yeah. the <clears throat> annotation so, platform that you use, yeah. maybe. Mm. Yeah, um, I can share with you. Let me see. I'm just going to share my screen for one second. Mm. Let's see if I do it right. So, desktop to share. Okay. okay. Can you see this annotation interface here? Yes, it's a little bit blurry, okay. but I yeah. think it, it works. Oh. Yes. So, this is a um, public document. I can share the link with you later. Uh, this is the um, annotation guidelines we have from Babel. This is a guide for our linguists to annotate content. So, here you have uh, this is a screenshot of the tool they use, the annotation tool. Mm -hmm. And you would have the instructions here that the, edit, the, the translator or the editor saw. And then you have the source and the target text. And then you, uh, the annotation process essentially is selecting spans, selecting words or sequences of words and assigning them an error type here on the right and a severity. Okay. And then um, internally, we convert that into a number uh, which, you know, it goes from minus infinite to 100. You know, you can have so many issues crammed into one paragraph that the final score is negative, uh, mm -hmm. but, um, you know, if we see something, for example, uh, if we expect a high quality translation to score 98. If we see something that goes below that and it goes below 90, for example, there may be 
um, big issues there that we have right. to address. Okay. And what you said before, these annotations are then used to train the Q, the quality estimation um, algorithms. Okay. Well, yeah. mm -hmm. So MQM kind of you use MQM MQM to um, for the quality estimation algorithm, but then a different error type classification for error annotation, right? Um, we I mean we use it the 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 main use uh, I would say for these annotations is uh, I'm going to stop sharing if it's okay. Yeah, that's yep. great. Yes, okay. thanks. Uh, so uh, the main use for these annotations, uh, I think, not the main use, but one of the <laughs> main <laughs> uses, it's uh, uh, giving clients visibility on the quality mm -hmm. that we are delivering. They're able to see that. And, and the quality estimation uh, model uh, is able to predict uh, annotations. You know, mm -hmm. so okay. I could say, okay, can you give me an automatic annotation of this job? And the quality estimation model will say, okay, there's an issue here that is um, major or critical or minor. And yeah, you, you can see that. I mean, there's various uses for, for the annotations, but those two are the, the biggest ones. The yeah. main ones. Okay, so I often wonder because you know, <laughs> training neural machine translation systems and, and new and emerging AI technologies like the recent large language models, I think it takes so much time and effort and investment and money that I always wonder how much do these technologies offset the costs of actually <laughs> hiring specialized human translators from scratch, <laughs> yeah. you know? Um, yeah, I, I would say that the biggest consideration is volume. You're going to be translated a few thousand words. Um, I mean, even more. You're going to be translating low volumes, probably not mm -hmm. worth it. Mm -hmm. Or, I mean, you could always connect, uh, you know, uh, to a, a, a DeepL or Google Translate API and send that to translation. But if you want to invest in your own systems, your own customized engines, you need to have a lot of volume for it to pay. So this model relies on that, you know, okay. on large, large, large volume. Yeah. Okay. So mm -hmm. it is it is an industry really that caters for a very specific niche. I mean, it's not something that obviously applies to the thousands of translation agencies and language service providers out there uh, simply mm -hmm. because of capabilities, yeah. right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think most, I mean, the biggest language service providers, there's a big uptake of machine translation because of their characteristics. You know, it's like you have a lot of content, maybe, you know, you have a client that uh, wants translations into 10 language, and then one day he said, okay, but I also want this language there uh, mm -hmm. fast, you know. So, um, yeah, large, 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 sorry, large language service providers, uh, have there's a report by NIMC uh, that says that eighty percent of them use MT. MT. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because it's the way of uh, you know that coping you can with show that you have yeah that it coping it makes sense yeah very good so uh, one of the um, arguments or well not arguments but concerns we've been hearing a lot in in academia but also in the industry I think it's uh, increasing exposure of human translators to MT, right? And, and, and the more recent uh, emergence of generative synthetic data. Uh, with this increasing exposure, do you see a potential de-skilling effect in the translation profession? Uh, more importantly, perhaps, to what extent could this lead to a reduction in language richness in, in general, hmm. in individual uh, stylistic expression and in a reduction in lexical diversity. I mean, that, that's worrying, I think. In a way. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it does. It leads to, you know, a kind of a standardization of uh, language. This is, you know, the concept that you are very familiar with of translation is, you know, when you read something and you know it was not written by a native, it sounds so much like English usually, which is the, like the dominant language. Um, TV, uh, online, social media, everything is English. You know, I, 
I sometimes hear how, um, you know, young people talk, teenagers talk. And if I remember our teachers back then putting those things as an example of, you know, a bad translation. Yeah. And in the, in the case of teenagers, I don't think they're influenced by mass information or if they are in, kind of indirect. Um, mm -hmm. They incorporate all these patterns and machine translation in general tends to be close to the mm. language. Mm. So yes, if imagine if you're only exposed to, to machine translation uh, and recently synthetic data, yeah, you're going to be missing out on a <laughs> lot of things. Imagine yeah. uh, writing off, I don't know, Cortaja, for example, that I cannot imagine a machine <laughs> issuing that. So, um, yeah, and in the case of synthetic data, it's probably, um, you know, there's Worse. more question. Yeah, because it's like, at least when you work from a source text, you, you can kind of assume that source text was written by someone, but then synthetic data, you don't know if what's written there is nonsense directly. I Even if you're familiar with the topic, you can just uh, lower your guard because mm. it all sounds so good, sounds great. And then maybe you're, you know, saying something that is just completely not. Yeah, so, feeding, er feeding errors, right? And yeah. Inaccuracies and, mm -hmm. So, yeah, I'm going to go all old school on this one. So, yeah, translate from scratch and read a lot to develop that linguistic mm -hmm. um, sensibility. Uh, yeah. So you know, diversity, um, diversity of exposure to, to different yeah, translation yeah. sessions. Very yeah. good. I remember some. I remember some of the teachers we had with. Um, you know, they were good. I think at instilling that sensibility, mm -hmm. and I think that's the key. You now, you know, that we have translation trainers and teachers who are able to to help future translators mm -hmm. develop that uh, love for language. I would say, yeah. And linguistic expertise. Very good, Marina. Now, moving quickly on to the topic of large language models again, because it's unavoidable these days. Um, which specific capabilities of these models do you think are the most impactful for the language industry at large, but for professional translators in particular? Mm -hmm. Can you walk us through a few specific use cases or applications that you can think of? Yeah. Um... I think um, the most obvious one, or yeah, is would be automated or machine translation. And in this sense, they can go beyond what traditional MT does, in that you can uh, the output of these models can be better adapted to specific uh, requirements yes. you have. Imagine you wanna uh, translate something into American English, but you wanna use British state format, for example. That's a, mm -hmm. just an example I made up. You can, uh, you know, convert that into a prompt, and the translation would hopefully, uh, you know, uh, produce what you were want. Um, machine translation, so, so uh, translation through LLMs, hmm. it's one I think is the case that so far has been proved to be, you know, super useful. There's also other cases, you know, content generation that we saw, like generating a text. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, in general, they can do all sort of natural language processing, high-level tasks, like name and user recognition, um, error correction, summarization. Um, how, I mean, how good or how well they do these things, and I'm putting um, machine translation or automated translation aside, how good name and user recognition is compared to other classical approaches to uh, and your permission, I, I think that's still an, an open question. Yes, maybe yeah. for those in the audience who are not familiar with name entity recognition, which kind of oh. natural language task is that? They can use yeah. Spain, it's in layman terms. <laughs> yeah, um, I think one, there's I remember looking at what is name entity recognition. What is a name entity? What is a name entity? It's not like you don't find a single mm. definition. You know, a name entity, I think the it could be anything that, uh, I think the most similar way uh, to define this is like 
a proper name. So if it has a proper name, it's an identity. So um, other definitions, um, you know, define it differently, but um, city names, country names, company names, brand names, numbers Beautiful. are considered numerical entities as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So name entity recognition is useful, for example, if you want to um, um, anonymize content. Imagine, you know, you say, okay, I have this letter and I want to erase all mentions to individual people, you know, mm -hmm. to identify can... those names, yeah. Yeah, it can also be very useful for interpreting, right, and for preparing interpreting assignments, especially when, you know, you can't quite get the name of the person who was just mentioned or maybe special pronunciation of a geographical location. So it could be powerful features, I think. Yeah. And some of those features were starting to see implemented in the work of translators and interpreters, not so much, as you said, for uh, translating and interpreting per se, but all the paratasks that are involved in, in, in effective translation and, and interpreting, right? Like terminology work, extraction, uh, summarization, and all of the tasks that you just mentioned. So, by the way, has Unbubble <clears throat> incorporated any LLM capabilities or other gen AI, generative AI technologies in their operational workflows? Or um... Uh, yeah, we we have some translation workflows that, uh, you know, where some things are translated through an LLM mm -hmm. uh, because LLMs are still very slow in production mm -hmm. and they are much more expensive compared to traditional neural machine translation. Yes. Um, and they tend, I mean, they tend to fail. I don't know. There was a chat with the audit later, uh, earlier this morning. So it's still a bit mm -hmm. shaky, the, you know, the... Um, uh, how robust these are. It is. Um, yeah, but I, uh, other than that, there's a research model, um, LLM model that Ambabel released in open source, and it's fine tuned to predict translation quality. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and I was talking to someone from research yesterday, they're planning to release soon another uh, generative uh, model which would be built on top of uh, Lama 2, one of these. Uh, Yes, foundation of a service model. Yeah, yeah, very interesting because um, in a similar fashion, I think um, it is our WS language weaver who's uh, just released this evolved model, which um, is not pre-trained the model to estimate quality, but um, to actually automatic post-edit <laughs> the machine translated output. So we're seeing applications both on the input and output side and. I wouldn't be surprised if, if in no time uh, there are applications that blend both capabilities. So that's that's very interesting. Now, um, one of the things I've been struggling with is uh, in regards to the integration of LLM prompting into traditional CAT tools and translation management systems. Um, how do you reimagine this space? I mean, for instance, how are issues of low latency addressed. I mean, the slow response that I've experienced myself in some of these tools and who typically bears the cost of uh, LLM prompting? Is it the freelance mm -hmm. translator? Is it the LSP? Is it a shared responsibility? Mm -hmm. how, how do you imagine that space? Mm -hmm. What's going on there? Mm -hmm. So the, the, the two examples I'm aware of, uh, one is RWS and you can integrate your own API key that, that means you have to pay yourself. Um, you know, you have to pay OpenAI for certain uses, and then you can integrate that key in RWS, and then you can use it to, you know, please correct this output, or please uh, highlight the errors here, or please mm, put this translation in a more informal tone. Mm -hmm. um, you would pay for every single use of the, you know, every time you click submit. Um, Another case I know, it's the, the, the MailCat tool that has an integration that has a very, very, I mean, much more constraint. So when you uh, have, um, you know, uh, translate something, there's a little button there that, you know, you highlight something and then you click that button. And what it does is it explains what's yeah. there. It provides a contextual definition, right? Of, yeah. yeah, that that's I, made case the audience didn't get it, made cut, yep. 
yeah. I think those um I haven't had an useful explanation of those bots. I heard recently the term botch plane and it mm. feels a bit like you're being botch plane. It's like uh I I I I haven't found a use case that worked for me. I may be more experienced in some things. It may help a junior translator. I don't know, but mm. In, mm. indeed, or or perhaps a translator joining a new subject area or domain, right? I mean, yeah, yeah, but, that's another use case. Yeah. Okay. Mm. Good. Now, in what specific ways do you think LLM technology can, can enhance or improve existing MT technologies? Or, or do you perhaps foresee a future where LLM machine translation might replace more specific and custom built MT systems altogether? Unlikely at this point, but do you foresee such a future? Mm. Yeah, I, I think the main issues now our cost and latency, as you said, it's uh, still much more expensive to translate to an LLM than it, it is to uh, new or whatever, any neural machine translation system, or even putting your own machine translation system in production is still cheaper. So okay. um, you mentioned before automatic post editing. I think that's uh, integration you know the mt produces a first output which sometime can be a bit close to the source text and then you ask an llm to say hey make this more idiomatic or more natural mm -hmm. um in terms of quality there was uh, recently there was uh, the wmt 2023 campaign where they released some results of quality they compared how well um llms uh, did in terms of translation compared to um DPL, Microsoft, Google, mm -hmm. and it did slightly better uh, in some languages, uh, but they did that with what they call a uh, few shot prompting. So mm -hmm. when you create a prompt, for example, uh, translate this sentence uh, from English into Spanish, the LLM will do the mm -hmm. translation. If you, in addition to that prompt, you give it examples, of English mm -hmm. to Spanish translation, mm -hmm. you are doing what's called few shot prompting. One shot prompting is one example, two shots, two examples, but and few the more shot text, several. Mm -hmm. yeah, but, but the more text you add, the more expensive, you know, it your becomes. LLM will be, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It, it is also shown, I think some of the papers recently that few shot inference doesn't necessarily lead to better quality results. I mean, it, it kind of reaches a plateau depending on the mm. model, right? And the tasks that it's been trained for. But yeah. I, think, I think there's a lot to be done still. So, and a lot yeah. of work and new emerging roles to, to, to emerge. We'll talk about those in a minute, but uh, perhaps uh, going back to something you mentioned before, and which is another concern, I think, uh, in the industry at large, and uh, perhaps less so for translators, but um, it's it relates to the issue of multilingual content generation. Since LLMs are now capable of generating content directly in multiple languages, could this ability bypass the practice of creating content in a source language and then translating it into other languages? Could it be could it be bypassed altogether that translation step? What do you um, think? I I think the in many traditional uh, workflows that won't be a solution because in many mm -hmm. translations you want high precision. Uh, you want to have a message mm -hmm. in one language and you want uh, the message or a, you know a description or a technical sheet or something. Mm -hmm. You want it to have the exact same content across different languages. If you generate content from scratch in different languages, mm -hmm. um, I think the that can work in some cases. For example, <clears throat> you know, imagine you want to talk about something, but you don't need to be, you know, this messaging or to be consistent across different locales. Uh, that would work, I guess, in a blog post, for example, from a travel agency. You know, mm -hmm. I want to write a post about uh, Alfama here in Lisbon uh, because I want to attract um, Spanish and Italian tourists 
age 30 to 40. And I, so I can just say to an LLM, okay, create a blog post for me. Um, this is the expected audience. Talk about the main attractions, but I'm not so concerned about differences in, in details. That would be one case. I don't see okay. any other use cases where that would work. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so it's similar to what we used to have in, in the old days, right, of um, parallel content authoring, which applies to certain projects and requirements, but, you know, others require that translation steep, especially with high quality requirements. So, very good. Okay, I have a couple of more questions for you, Marina, <laughs> and then I think we'll hand it over to the audience. But um, one of the issues I struggle as well with sometimes is how much more cognitive load uh, will freelance translators be exposed to with increasing layers of technology. So, for example, if we go back to the example of automatic quality evaluation, if on top of everything now translators have to actually verify both errors identified by LLMs and potentially overlook errors, how much complexity are we adding to that quality assurance <laughs> process? Do, do you see this as a disadvantage or yeah. not necessarily? Um, I think the key to make something useful, whether it's AI or it's mm. uh, old school UX design, is making sure that you know you put the human experience in the first place. So if I have to be, you know, unchecking every single LLM suggesting that there's an error and I don't have a way of toggling that off, I would be, yeah, yeah, I would be frustrated, you know. Hmm. So I think for me, the key is to make something that is useful as a sort of assistant hmm. in the same way that I use ChatGPT, for example, as a sort of uh, intern. Hmm. Um, because different users have different needs and if you don't take into account that, you risk just, you know, creating that situation that you just described. Um, so, think. yeah, I think that's a UX design uh, problem, you know, how yeah. these things can be integrated, yeah. Indeed, and um, I suppose it's similar to, to that kind of interactive uh, machine translation approach where it offers you suggestions all the time. Personally, for example, I find it really confusing. I'd rather not have so many suggestions to choose from. Uh, yeah. But again, I suppose it's also a matter of personal working habits and style. So, yeah, we'll have to see how it goes. In fact, as we look into the future in the language industry, what kind of market trends do you foresee? And could you perhaps offer any tips uh, for translators at various stages in their careers to navigate these changes effectively? What kind of a skill sets and, and new linguistic AI roles do, do you envisage mm -hmm. in, this, in this new space? Okay. Um, uh, in, terms, yeah, in terms of market trends, uh, at the moment, if you try to keep up with everything that is going on in this uh, stage, you, you get uh, tired so you see so I think we're still in the you know riding the wave when that wave comes down you know there will be some who have found a way of making LLMs productive and you know for specific use cases and a lot of people are trying to do a lot of things so I don't know in one year time what will be what the, the scenery be I don't know but yeah um, what I think will happen is that AI will still be, um, you know, in vogue, let's say. So if you are as a language graduate or a translation graduate are interested in AI, my recommendation would be right, to dig deep into those aspects of AI that attract you the most. Uh, it's not only training models, it's not only being super technical, there's a lot of dimensions you can uh, explore. Um, so uh, I would say just try to understand the theory behind it, but also acquire the practical skills that you need. You know, there's probably some coding there, but it, in a kind of um, easy way, you know, it's not like super. So there's a lot of uh, uh, Coursera, uh, I don't know, Python, R, uh, 
that are if you're interested into that it's a great opportunity you know it has never been so easy to learn what you want so in specific i mean data visualization you know if you want to present the results of what you work what you do mm -hmm. um data analysis if you want to look into the quality of these uh, models um i think that's one recommendation look into what you and what attracts you the most and try to learn what you need to do it. Also, more traditional ways of connecting with people and be on the lookout for opportunities, you know, the prompt engineer jobs where, you know, people who have a good training on languages that who can make up a coherent sentence, they, yeah. they will have advantage. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I see with all this increase, in AI and this larger integration that I think will happen, uh, I think I still think there's a consistent need for human expertise. And mm -hmm. um, yeah, so translators yeah. who combine this language proficiency with AI skills, I think they will be in high demand. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I am one to think that. Um, I think new opportunities will arise and and even new job profiles. So rather than being perhaps fearful of, of replacement or a lot of disruption, but certainly a lot of new opportunities too. Okay, Marina, well, thank you so much for sharing your insights with me. I think mm -hmm. it is now time for the audience to pick your brains. Uh, and I'm going to hand over to Paula to do the Q&A moderation. I know there's a question already on ethics, which I purposefully did not touch upon because I knew it would come up. <laughs> so, Paula, over to you. And thanks, Marina. Yes, thank you, Vanessa and Marina. We do have a couple of questions. Uh, Zoe Gallardo was asking, is the use of LLMs ethical? A big question here. Sorry, I, I don't think I got it. Is the use of LLMs? Is ethical. Ah, ah, yeah. There's the there's, you know, there's the debate. Um, or there's some issues that are open, like copyright. I would imagine that what this question refers to. Um, last week I think there was a law passed in the European Union about uh, regulating AI. Yeah. So yeah, I think the uses of AI there will be some ethical and some unethical uses. Now, um, the uh, data surveillance, for example, that would be an unethical use. Now, in terms of copyright, there's, I know there's a lot of lawsuits open. I think probably we need to figure out what copyright, how copyright applies to large language models who are trained on public data. Uh, the, this is a legitimate concern. I. I, I, I don't know, I'm not able to offer any further insight because it's not my, you know, my topic, but yeah, it's something to look out for, yeah. Yeah, totally. Uh, we do have another question from Richard saying, how automatic is MQM? Um, so M MQM is, say, um, you have to set up your own framework is not automatic. You know, we have annotators annotating it. What is automatic, we can say, is the calculation of the score, which takes into account the number of errors, their severity, and divides that by the number of words. That calculation is done automatically. But then the other case, it was if you have those annotations, uh, if you send those annotations through uh, AI model, the model can learn to annotate, you know, in that would be an automatic application of MQM, yeah. And Richard was also uh, asking, um, how competitive is the sector? Are your clients loyal? Is price a critical factor? Um, a very good question, very interesting, but very yeah. tricky questions at the same time. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, this is a competitive industry and Technology puts the pressure uh, to be more competitive, you know, because there's also, you know, people are aware of uh, how fast the stage you can get a machine translation. They can have an idea of uh, how good the translation is if they put that text in in the pale, for example. 
it is a very competitive landscape and and in terms of um clients um yeah i mean i'm i'm not able to say <laughs> much but yes uh, some clients are you know have been with us for many years so yeah and uh, we're running out of time. Let's pick the last question. Does Unbabel use its own in-house translation platform? Uh, yeah, we have our own interface to translate, yeah. I think that's it. Uh, thank you very much, Vanessa and Marina, of course. And to all of you who have joined us today and are still there, I remind you that the next capsula will take place on the 23rd of January with Nuria Perez and Lydia Bruguet talking about the challenges of uh, translating erotic literature. So see you there. Thank you. Bye.